This week on ANN, members in Papua New Guinea are urged to pray for the nation's upcoming election season and then encouraged to refrain from voting on election dates that fall on the Sabbath. Oakwood University opens the largest organic urban farm in the northern region of the U.S. state of Alabama. And, after years of earnest prayer, leaders and members celebrate the opening of a state-of-the-art church in Cardenas, Cuba. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. As Papua New Guinea enters its election season, the leader of the church's territory in the region asked members to pray for the nation. According to one of the country's major news outlets, Papua New Guinea Today, the church's president for the nation asked the 294,000 Adventist members to pray for the election of honorable representatives. Kepsi Aloto also asked members to pray for peaceful and smooth election processes that won't lead to discord, especially within the church. Aloto said, unity is paramount in the church. History has shown that elections bring about disunity among believers. Aloto also urged members to abstain from participating in elections that fall on Saturdays. When making reference to the importance of observing the Sabbath, especially when dealing with elections, he said, while we respect our authority, God's law is superior. According to Acts 5 verse 9, let's abide by God's law. The church's only historically black university recently became the site of the largest organic urban farm in the U.S. state of Alabama's northern region. Oakwood Farms is part of the university's industry recovery initiative. The initiative helps the university keep tuition low by turning funds back into capital, employing students, and teaching them the value of industry and entrepreneurship. The Industry Recovery Initiative will position Oakwood to serve the community of North Alabama with healthy and affordable goods. Leaders say Oakwood Farms is a practical way to promote a healthy lifestyle based on biblical principles. Oakwood's OUBN has more. Have you heard about Oakwood Farms? A blueberry orchard is coming to campus. It should be about 1,800 plants out there. We will have some production this year. We have at least 800 that um, are about five years old, three to, four, three to four years old. So we plan to have some crop this year. Then right after that, we'll put the um, muscadine, scuffinine, also some uh, red grapes, seedless, uh, a few pomegranate trees, and also persimmons so, and figs. We're gonna be the largest urban farm, and we're just starting. Oakwood has 1,186 acres, so we've got about 30 of them on the front side of the campus that we're now farming. But we've got a lot of land and it's fertile and it's rich. And this can be a wonderful opportunity for us to bless the community in ways that we hadn't imagined before. Watch for pecan and walnut trees in the near future. Oakwood Farms will also have a vegetable garden with a large variety of organic and heirloom plants. More than 1,200 people celebrated the opening of the state-of-the-art church in Cardenas, Matanzas, Cuba, on April 22. The construction inauguration of the church came as a result of many years of earnest prayer and major efforts from Maranatha Volunteers International. The nonprofit Adventist organization provides ur urgently needed churches and schools around the world. Each year, Maranatha not only raises awareness and funds for hundreds of projects, but also mobilizes thousands of volunteers to construct the requested buildings. Maranatha Volunteers International sent this report. It was standing room only at the dedication of the Cardenas Cuba Seventh-day Adventist Church on April 22, 2017. More than 1,200 people gathered to witness the opening of the long-awaited church, including representatives from the Cuban government, and the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. The celebration marks the answer to a decades-long prayer by the Cardenas congregation. The group had outgrown their space long ago, and members have been praying for a larger place to worship. Their answer arrived in 2015, when Maranatha finally received permission to build the church and broke ground on the project. The 12,000 square foot church has seating for 500 people in the main sanctuary and more on the second floor. The building was designed to accommodate worship for the local congregation and also serve as a place for convocations and retreats. The Cardenas Church was funded and constructed by Maranatha Volunteers International, a supporting ministry of the Adventist Church. 
Over the past 20 years, Maranatha has renovated and constructed more than 200 projects in Cuba, including a seminary in Havana. Cardenas is among the largest churches Maranatha has ever built, and it is one of the largest Adventist churches in Cuba. Also in Cuba, nearly six decades have passed since the Adventist Church has been able to train literature evangelists in the nation. But that all changed March 23rd through the 25th. The historic three-day Bringing Hope Congress was a step toward reshaping the publishing ministries in Cuba from the ground up, according to organizers. Literature evangelists were taught about God's plan for publications and their role as missionary messengers. Leaders and administrators were instructed on the process of structuring, recruiting, and preparing literature evangelists, setting goals, and starting a literature evangelist school. The training was prepared to help empower and encourage members who have been sharing literature since 2014 without official training. The president of the Adventist Church in Cuba, Alda Perez, said, while this is relatively new, he has faith God will help the ministry excel. He said, this is all new to us. Coal portering was not part of our ministry on the island years ago, but by the grace of God, we will fulfill the task ahead with publications. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, increased and unregulated television content may affect daily routines such as eating and communication patterns and may decrease time spent on other activities. This statistic and others related to television consumption led an Adventist to create Safe TV in 1995. With more than 20 years in the broadcast industry, safe TV has not gone unnoticed. In fact, the governor of the U.S. state of Arkansas, where the station is headquartered, recently proclaimed May 8, Safe Television Day for the state. Safe TV was recognized during the special ceremony for reaching the secular world for Christ with programming that uplifts God, family, and country. You can learn more about Safe TV by visiting safetv.org. A new Adventist radio station was launched in Birmingham, England at the stroke of midnight Greenwich Mean Time Zone on April 13. Hope FM features programming about health, hope, and Bible studies. The station also offers children's programs, shares gospel music and testimonies, and guides listeners through the biblical book of Revelation. The station also features a Hope FM live chat that allows listeners to engage with presenters in real time. More than 11,000 people have listened online since the station launched. You can visit hopefm.org.uk to learn more about this growing evangelistic tool. If you ever find yourself in South America and want to find an Adventist church, all you'll need is your cell phone and the Find a Church mobile app. The Seventh-day Adventist Church of South American Territory this week announced the release of the newest update of the Find a Church app. Leaders also highlighted the app's corresponding website with the same name. The update allows more search results to display at once and the ability to filter results by cities. The app also syncs with Google Maps and Waze to help guide users to desired locations. The Find a Church app has more than 20,000 registered Adventist churches in eight South American countries. The app is available in Apple's App Store and Google Play. A professor from the Adventist University of Health Science was recently recognized for significantly contributing to the growth and development of medical ultrasound. Professor Charlotte Henningsen, Chair of the Diagnostic Medical Sonography Department, is the recipient of the 2017 Distinguished Sonographer Award from the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, or AIUM. Henningsen was given the award on March 26 in the U.S. state of Florida. This award is given annually to a current or retired member of AIUM. Henningsen has been a credentialed sonographer for over 30 years and has worked as an educator for 26 years. Her list of accomplishments includes chairing a three-year collaborative task force hosted by the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography. The task force developed the first national educational curriculum for sonography. This week, she transitioned as the university's department chair of sonography to the associate vice president for faculty development in teaching and learning. Coming up, women in Botswana whose children have left the church encourage each other during a special weekend program. But up next, leaders in Kenya are motivated to sustain major evangelism efforts in the nation. May I work in with you, young fella? Yeah. Go for it.
That's the way you do it. Got to put a little weight on it. But I'll put it back up here for you. Меня зовут Азанета, и я говорю по-русски. Есть так много замечательных видеофильмов, но так мало из них переводятся. Вы можете помочь. Join the Amara translation and caption team today. Amara is easy to learn and fun. You can volunteer in your free time. Join this community today and provide great content in your language. Welcome back. While Adventist leaders in Kenya are still celebrating 20,000 baptisms that resulted from a recent two-week evangelism campaign, they are also aiming to keep up the momentum and remain inspired. Ideas were exchanged and data shared among 400 ministers during a five-day conference at the University of Eastern Africa, Baritin, in Kenya. The event was organized by Adventist Church's territory in Western Kenya. The Seventh-day Adventist Church's Executive Secretary, G.T. Ng, was among the keynote speakers for the conference. Ng challenged the pastors to be faithful stewards in whatever office they have been called to serve. Making reference to the Apostle John's ministry while in exile, he said, Why is it that when you are called to a higher position, God has called you, but when you are sent to the island of Patmos, the nominating committee has made a mistake? The church's associate secretary, Hensley Marovin, delivered statistics regarding church growth and retention. Marovin said, evangelism is a cycle that involves revival, training, and equipping members for outreach, reaping, and nurture. Currently, there are 2,740 churches with 380,000 members in Western Kenya. Church leaders and members are praying the Lord will lead 400,000 people to baptism this year. Women's Ministries for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern Botswana organized a unique event for mothers of former Adventists. The PALS program drew 75 women from the country's Kanye district. The mothers were of different ages, but all had adult children who have wandered from God. PALS program is designed to provide a platform for such parents to offload their burdens, find support, pray together, and build relationships that have God as their foundation. The three-day program had three main focus areas, accepting, loving, and praying. A district pastor within Kanye applauded the church for conducting this thoughtful program. Benza Benda said, such programs should teach us how much the church cares about our families. We as a church are a family. Therefore, it is important to embrace one another, invite more women even outside the church, so that our society may benefit child guidance programs as well as understand the love of Jesus. The church's South Botswana Media Center has more. The whole purpose of gathering here is for us to come and learn about how we can support each other as women and know that prayer sustains our journey in nurturing our children be it from the young mother to the elderly mother. We are having a struggle in bringing up our own children. Our children, we tend to lose them on the way, possibly being because we don't really understand how to grow them. And we later lose courage. We get disappointed when they don't remain in church. And coming together, we, we are here to learn how to support one another prayerfully. Students from various health-related schools of Loma Linda University Health memorialized 165 people who donated their bodies to science. The service provided a chance for students from the schools of allied health professions, dentistry, medicine, and nursing to pay tribute to the people who offer their bodies for the purposes of education. Loma Linda University operates the largest cadaver anatomy lab in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Its Bodies for Science program allows living donors to sign agreements stipulating that their bodies will be donated to the university at the time of their death. According to LLUH, the students learn from the cadavers over a period of a few months to two years. After that, the bodies are cremated at the university's expense. The ashes are either returned to the family or interred in a community burial plot purchased by the university. After cremation, family members and friends are invited to the memorial service. 
For the memorial service on April 13, relatives of the deceased provided photographs of their loved ones for the students to view. The students took time during the program to share how the donors had enriched their lives and touched their hearts. Students who were able to attend expressed their gratitude for the sacrifice of the donors and their families. A local church in the northeastern town of New South Wales, Australia, partnered with Food Bank Australia to make a food pantry available to its community. The Gunada Seventh-day Adventist Church recently joined two additional Adventist churches that operate food pantries. The food ministry allows families in need to purchase non-perishable items at highly discounted prices. Gunada's pantry is open every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The items include canned vegetables and fruit, biscuits, chips, sweets, home care products, baby formula, and diapers. A limited amount of fresh fruit and vegetables are also available. Food Bank Australia sells products that are close to their use-by dates, have incorrect labeling or damaged packaging, as well as excess stock and discontinued products. Without the organization, the food would be discarded and sent to landfills. If you were with us last week, you'd recall the opening of a youth training center in Mongolia. At the end of the story, we mentioned that right after the building was dedicated, it was immediately put to use as the location of a lay congress. Well, during the lay congress, two women became recipients of funds for their educational studies thanks to a ministry from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Akon Bayrazul and Gunsuk Otgon Balor were presented with award letters from the Scholarshiping Our Sisters, or SOS, program. The women are studying English and psychology, respectively. The program is managed by Women's Ministries of the Church's headquarters. Funds are solicited for businesses, retirees, women's organizations, and other interested groups and individuals. SOS has given more than 2,300 scholarships in over 132 countries. The scholarships have amounted to more than $1 million. Funds are awarded on the basis of academic achievement, financial need, community outreach, and the recipient's determination to empower herself through education. To learn more about the scholarship, visit AdventistWomensMinistries.org. Coming up, our social media segment is back with news about the GAME 2017 conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil. But up next, reflect on a document that was signed in 1215 regarding religious and political matters that would go on to influence the Constitution and Bill of Rights of the United States. The smell in that room, my husband said, was so strong that he felt like he himself was going to suffocate if he stayed there any longer. And so he rushed over to the crib and felt Simon to see if he was still breathing. And he grabbed Simon and brought him out of the room. In the morning, we took him to the doctor and the doctor said, yes, that was definitely a close call, but Simon is great. There's no problem with him whatsoever. And so no longer did I ever feel that those nightly prayers we had for Simon's protection were a routine. Yes, we did them on a routine basis, but they made a difference. My name is Marla and my prayer was answered. Welcome back. Once Pope Innocent III overstepped his authority by concerning himself with England's national affairs, the nation's bishops moved into action. The drafting and signing of the Magna Carta in 1215 will forever be linked to the importance of protecting civil liberties. Learn more in this week's episode of Lineage Magna Carta, the foundation of freedom. To learn more, visit lineagejourney.com. The Magna Carta was signed just over 800 years ago here in Runnymede, a document that would have both civil and religious importance for England and also for the whole world. The backdrop to the signing of the Magna Carta was the growing tension between the King of England and the Pope over who had the authority to appoint the bishops of London and Canterbury. At that time, the King of England, King John, was probably one of our weaker kings. The Pope at that time, Pope Innocent III, was probably one of the stronger Popes. And in this battle, the Pope eventually won. 
Because the king was unable to count on the support of the barons because he had conflict with them, he eventually surrendered to the papal legate in 1213, even laying his crown down at the feet in an act of submission. He also agreed to pay 1,000 marks per year and that should any of his successors break that agreement, they would lose all authority in the realm. England was humiliated. The barons were stung into action. They would never be slaves to the Pope. The issue of national sovereignty and the exchanging of money for spiritual benefits was at stake. They feared, and rightly so, that this could be one step in a course of events that would lead the Pope to setting up who he wanted to on the English throne, overreaching his authority into national matters. These were some of the main reasons why Magna Carta was signed on the 15th of June, 1215. The first clause stated, the Church of England shall be free and hold her rights entire and her liberties inviolate. This issue would rumble on for the next 150 years and the money due to be paid to Rome lapsed over time and became sporadic. This was one of the main reasons of John Wycliffe's early disagreements with Rome. Another key aspect of the Magna Carta was the basis of law that it set up that the king and the lawmakers were subject to the same law that they themselves wrote, that those accused were granted the right to be tried by a jury of their peers. These, among many other clauses, form the basis of law and justice as we know it today. Many of the principles of Magna Carta form the basis of the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights in America. In fact, this monument here was paid for by the ABA, the American Bar Association. Today, there are four remaining original copies of the Magna Carta. One in the Lincoln Castle, one in St. Mary's Cathedral in Salisbury, and two in the British Library. The principles of Magna Carta, which live on today, stand to us as a testament that we should cherish our civil liberties, that we should protect our civil liberties and that we should use the time that we have now in the spreading of the gospel while we have the ability to do so. We're happy to announce that our social media segment is back. The social media manager for the Adventist Church, Emily Mastrapa, along with ANN's new social media correspondent, Kati Britton, are here to share the latest news regarding our church online. This week, learn how you can stay connected with the Global Adventist Internet Network. Registration is now open for GAIN 2017. And the theme for this year is Wired for Mission. The Global Adventist Internet Network will inspire every communicator to reach areas of the world with little to no Christian presence. And social media is going to help make that possible. GAIN will be held on the campus of Brazil Adventist University in Sao Paulo, Brazil, August 9th through the 13th. So for those of you who can attend, it's okay. We'll be posting live videos on Facebook throughout the conference, including a live video from Novo Tempo, which is the largest Seventh-day Adventist production studio in the world. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the game community can get information and exchange ideas before, during, and after the conference through the game Slack channel. Wait, what's a Slack channel? Well, Slack is a team messaging tool, and it's really great for organizing all your communication in one place. And you can set up public channels, or you can set up a private channel where people have to be invited into it. Oh, that's awesome. How do I join? Well, you can go to slack.gain.avenus.org and put in your email, and then you can start collaborating with others. And it's great, because even after you leave the conference, that's still going to be there, and you can keep 
communicating with people. That's awesome. You can also follow along by using the hashtag GAIN17. Let us know if you're going and what you're most excited about or visit gain.adventist.org for more information. And finally for today's program, let's turn to Henry Hilton for a look at Adventist history. This week, learn about the establishment of two Adventist medical institutions in Tokyo and Trinidad. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. This week we celebrate the medical mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as we reflect on the humble beginnings and growth of medical institutions that serve not only the physical but the spiritual needs of their communities. On May 1, 1929, a 20-bed hospital was built on the Union Mission compound in Tokyo, Japan. This medical facility was operated by a small staff led by Dr. Edward Getzlaff. The initiative was the result of sacrifice of the church members in Japan who contributed more than two-thirds of the 50,000 yen cost. The hospital has since grown to a 186-bed facility providing superb medical treatment and is now known as the Tokyo Adventist Hospital. Just 19 years later, on May 1, 1948, through the efforts of medical missionary Dr. Robert F. Dunlop of Scotland, the Port of Spain Seventh-day Adventist Clinic was opened on the island of Trinidad in the Southern Caribbean. This clinic was started through renting a few small rooms and with a small staff of only four persons, including Dr. Dunlop. Through Providence, they were soon able to secure a large building for a small sum of $3,500. The clinic continued to grow through the years and is now a major hospital in the region, now known as a Community Hospital of Seventh-day Adventist. These stories demonstrate that from modest beginnings, God can bless and enable institutions of His planting to grow exponentially, thereby enabling them to minister to the needs of those they serve and to testify of His goodness. And that was This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching our 300th episode of ANN. It's been an honor to serve you these past six years. Make sure you join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your feedback and tell us how your church is making a difference in its community. Be sure to capture plenty of video footage and photos, then write up a summary of the event's important details. And feel free to send full video reports as well. You can reach us by sending us an email to annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's a passage of good news from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. The passage says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care. <laughs>